So I need to kind of address the elephant in the room first, which is um, as a male who likes his health and fitness and wants to take care of his body, I have to admit that you'd be my number one man crush on the internet when it comes to physique. Do you get that a lot? And do you get it more from men or women? Oh, definitely more from men. How to quantify it? <laughs> I don't know if it's a lot. It's, you know, it's enough to pay attention to. And it's got its uh, pros and cons. Let's put it that way. On this week's podcast episode, we talk with the one and only Marcus Philly, the creator of Functional Bodybuilding and the Instagram champion himself. We talk about the carnivore diet, his struggles and relationship to body image, getting through highly stressful times, digestive issues, haters online, and much, much more. Enjoy the episode. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Momentum Lifestyle Podcast by myself, Blake Worrell Thompson. And me, Genoa Van Keekum. Momentum is a men's wellbeing and performance community dedicated to helping men be better. Each week we deep dive with your favorite thought leaders and experts from around the world to get their insights to help you be better. Enjoy the episode. Now guys, before we get started on this week's podcast, I want to talk to you about our Momentum Mastermind. The Mastermind is our 12 month program for men who want to surround themselves with other committed men, all with similar interests, values and goals. Whether you're looking to build or grow a profitable lifestyle business, develop financial freedom, get in the best shape of your life, or create an intimate and epic relationship, the Mastermind is perfect for those who are looking to have it all. We know that to create these results and this kind of lifestyle on your own can be super challenging. So join now for your free 30-day trial. Simply visit our website, www.themomentumlifestyle.com.au. Up the top, you'll see a section for programs. Click on the programs, you'll see our mastermind and you can sign up there now for your free 30-day trial valued at $1,000. We look forward to seeing you part of the mastermind. Marcus Philly, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Blake. Mate, looking forward to chatting all things health, fitness, moving, uh, even life as a functional bodybuilder with a family, um, which would no doubt throw a few curveballs in there. Um, but before we get started on all that, can you give the guys a 60 to 90 second spiel on who you are and what's got you to where you are today? Yeah, sure. I see myself as a lifelong learner of uh, of fitness and, and health and wellness. Um, got my start moving with purpose when I was like eight or nine years old, training as a young kid, hit the gym at 13 and, and never never looked back along the way, uh, competed in some high level sports, um, soccer, golf, and then CrossFit got my start in coaching people officially for pay, um, about 13 years ago. And, uh, that was about a year after, or two years after I left, uh, a career in medicine or education in medicine. So traditional allopathic medical school. So, I'm sort of somebody who's been just trying to peel back layers of health and fitness for a long time, chose a number of different paths along the way, got lots of experience myself in coaching. And, and my goal is to just, uh, keep sharing that with people. And if they find value in it, then, uh, we can keep a business alive. So I need to kind of address the elephant in the room first, which is, um, as a male who likes his health and fitness and wants to take care of his body. I have to admit that you'd be my number one man crush on the internet when it comes to physique. Do you get that a lot? And do you get it more from men or women? Oh, definitely more from men. How to quantify it? <laughs> I don't know if it's a lot. It's, you know, it's enough to pay attention to. And it's got its uh, pros and cons. Let's put it that way. I'm fascinated in the pros and cons. We might, oh, I didn't expect to go here, but what sure. what are the pros and cons of the uh, the attention that you get around your physique? it starts with why do I have this physique to begin with hmm. and uh, what has been my attachment or my focus on it for what, and what period of time of my life. That's sort of the pro that's pros and cons attached to that. So, I mean, I, I first really became, I mean, I was aware of my, my physicality and how I looked and projected to the world, even as a teenager. But when I was in my late teens, early twenties, um, I became a little uh, more hyper aware of it. And I got into physique manipulation through diet and exercise, AKA bodybuilding, the get lean and ripped version, not the put on massive muscle version of bodybuilding. They're both part of the same 
kind of category and just getting, getting connected to that early, early in life, you know, at 20 years old, that stuck with me for a long time. And in a way that was like, you could say there's good and bad parts of it, but there's definitely some, some cons to that. It's like, you know, being hyper aware of body image, being lean, wanting to appear lean, you know, that leads to a particular amount of focus, hyper focus, you know, in a way that at times wasn't the healthiest of behaviors. So that's something I've contended with for close to 20 years of my life. And then the outward projection of that is often, you know, a lean muscled physique that people see and it's attractive to a certain group of people. They see it and they're, they want to emulate it or they, they value seeing somebody who can do a lot of the things that they want to do physically, but also look a particular way. And it's hard to see through all of, you know, take a snapshot of somebody's physique and see everything that goes behind it. So the pro would be that it, you know, it can get people to stop and pay attention. But the con is that it's hard to, it's, it's a process to educate people on, you know, how that, how to attain or achieve a body like that through means that aren't so difficult and challenging that you have to give up the rest of your life. And then I guess one more piece to that is in the last maybe three to five years, there's been a, a growth or a rise in the amount of conversations around PED use, performance enhancing drugs. Hmm. And a lot of outspoken individuals, particularly in YouTube and social media, but YouTube is this main platform. A lot of people are talking about the use or abuse or just maintenance doses of hormone replacement and other PEDs to the point where I feel like it's normalized using hormone replacement or, or drugs, not just, and I'm not talking about people who have like, you know, they were suffering from the consequences of low hormone status and got doctor's prescriptions for them. And they use TRT or HRT or something like that to get back to baseline, but that it's sort of gotten into the fitness industry where it's like, you know, so-and-so is on TRT or this person's on TRT. And, and honestly, there's this like kind of assumption amongst an audience in the fitness space that all fitness influencers or coaches or people that have an online fitness profile that have a lean physique or, you know, show a physique that looks well-muscled must therefore be on steroids. And so there's sort of this like, and I don't even really engage too much in the, that discourse and like the, you know, I, I have done some specific content around it, but like, I don't really get back into it with people be like, Hey, I'm natty. And this is, I've never, you know, it's like, I know my story. I know my truth. And um, it's like, it's a distracting conversation that has to happen and, or that ends up happening. And if I wasn't this lean, I might not get much as much attention, but I certainly wouldn't have people asking me mm -hmm. about, oh, you must be on drugs. It's like you, you get asked if you're on PEDs is, is like it's a sign that you're doing something with your training, your nutrition, your physique, your body composition that appears unattainable. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's a conversation starter, but it's also a distraction sometimes. And so that that's again, pros and cons, you know, mixed in and intertwined. So I covered a lot, but I'll, I'll pause now and let you follow up. How does that sit with you, that approach, you know, and again, without knowing your history, but the, the way that you just spoke of it, how does that sit with you and potentially other natural people? And again, similar to kind of what you said, you can get caught in the noise and make a big deal of it, or you can just continue to kind of show up you know, as, as pure and authentic as you, as you can be, but what, what's the general feeling for you who obviously dedicates a big portion of their life to really, you know, doing it one way and then to be criticized or critiqued or questioned, how does that kind of sit with you as you kind of navigate, you know, a big business and, and mm -hmm. big brand that you've got? There's two things that come to mind. Um, number one was, uh, a perspective that I got from Ben Patrick, who's um, he's a pretty influential coach out there who 
has a Instagram, you know, a social media handle knees over toes guy. A lot of people know him. He's got notoriety through the quality of his work, but also just the person he is. And, um, yeah, it kind of went viral the last few years, but I've spoken to Ben about it and he kind of painted this picture, which was super clear to me. He's like, well, for every one person that has something bad to say that you engage with, no matter how long that takes to engage with that person, and it might not go anywhere and you might not resolve any of their, you know, claims or issues. That's time spent that could have been spent talking to somebody who supports you a lot or one mm -hmm. of your many fans and program followers and clients or your wife or your kids. Um, so engaging with people, the haters, <laughs> is not only and most often a waste of time, just the pure exchange of time for what you might get out of it. It's a direct removal of opportunity with somebody who loves you and cares and, and or a prospective customer. So mm. I always think about that when I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to say something back to this person or I want to, you know, and that's not to say that I don't engage at all because I think there are opportunities that present themselves when there are accusations or false accusations or, you know, somebody says something where one in addressing it, I can make a, I can inform the people who are my supporters, right? It's because they're going to read the comment. Two, oftentimes people have negative things to say. They're not drug allegations or PED allegations, something like that, but they're, you know, hey, like what you said here contradicts something you said before. What the heck is that about? You know, they're angry. And maybe it's like going to force me to look at myself and be like, okay, am I contradicting myself? Is this, Am I not staying in alignment with my message and my values? And, you know, periodically somebody's got a point and I have to maybe admit something or, you know, provide more context or say, hey, you know what? You're right. Like, and I've evolved and I've learned and I've grown and this is my stance now. And a year ago when I did this, like this is right. And, and a good example of that recently is about a year ago at this time, I was heavily, heavily engaged and experimenting with a very strict animal-based diet based uh, defi as defined by Paul Saladino, carnivore yeah, MD. Carnival, yeah. It was essentially meat and organs, raw dairy and fruit. And then um, that's it. Like, so no vegetables. But if you look at like the fruit uh, world, the uh, you know something like a zucchini or a cucumber is actually a fruit. So there's some uh, squashes or you know vegetable type foods that kind of fall. And so I was just like, I I I followed it to the T. And as I do with everything, when I'm I like to showcase my lifestyle. I like to show my food. I like to show my training. And when I learn, when I want to learn something and explore something and experiment with something, like I go all in. So if I'm going to be doing this for six months, do I take six months off of showing anything that I've had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner while I'm, you know, low key kind of exploring a new concept and seeing how, what, what benefits to gather from it? My answer is no, like I'm not going to just stop posting. So I'm going to post some stuff and you've got the people that, that are really it triggered by Paul or liver king or people who eat you know organs or people who follow a carnivore-ish diet and um i think i was kind of getting lumped into that group by a few mm. people they've seen like in the past three or four months i've kind of shifted back uh, back to a way of eating that's like a lot more carbohydrate rich a lot more vegetables a lot more grains and they want to say like well look at you just flip-flopping all that nonsense that you were spewing about you know, animal-based dieting and you were like misleading people and you were doing this and that. And, you know, uh, I had to kind of take a step back and be like, okay, what is the message that I put out there? And what was I trying to achieve in this process? What was I trying to learn? And uh, ultimately, what is the same now as it was a year ago? And what is different? And why did I even go through that process? So I in my heart of heart, I don't feel like I was trying to deceive anybody. I, I feel like there were a lot of merits to that approach. There are a lot of things about it that I still consider important to this day. Um, and 
there are things that just didn't work as I found myself further and further into it, trying to train and perform the way I like to train and perform. So I made a pivot. And that's the kind of like hater feedback that has, it's, it's slightly misguided or it's a little bit off base, but it's not completely unfounded in some truth. So I have to look at that and look at myself and then evaluate it and be like, okay, well, how do I, how do I share a message that helps people understand the context that that was in and where I'm at today? And ultimately, I think those types of hater feedback uh, really elevate the conversation. And that's why I don't want to like ignore all of it because there's some, mm-hmm. there's some merit to it. How do you, how do you, I'm interested to know how you, as someone who is obviously super dialed in both from a training and nutrition point of view, how did you find that personally for you? And, you know, I'm sure different people find these type of diets, if that's the right word or bit, it's questionable, challenging and, and, and there's pros and cons and, as someone who's super dialed in, there's a difference between a lot of people who are kind of half try can't, you know, the carnival diet and someone like yourself who, you know, as you said, went all in. How did you feel when you went all in on that from both the training and a nutrition point of view? Specifically that diet? Yeah. Yeah. That one. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's see. There's a couple things. And I mean, there's, there's multiple variables that kind of got intertwined during that process for me. Mm. So number one, I have had a history of, and at different times in my life of like digestive distress and issues. So they date back to kind of the first period of time in my life where I encountered this was sort of around the last year of my college and the couple of years I spent in medical school. I was under a lot of stress, both, you know, academic, but emotional and psychological stress and it's pretty very depressed at those periods of time in my life. Um, that was more like purpose, drive, where I was headed in life, um, an injury that I had suffered. So like things that just compounded. And for this period of time in my life, I was somebody who was living off of you know the the digestive health aisle at the at the supermarket. It was you know every form of fiber, laxative, enema anything that could like, I had every tool in my toolbox to be able to keep myself, you know, regular in, the, in the, my digestion, regular poop on a, on a schedule. And it was horrible. And it really, you know, it, anybody who's living that life, uh, it's not awesome. It's not optimal. And I never got to the point where I was like, this is normal. That's fine. You know, I got all these pills and things I can take and it's all good. A lot of people do. They just are like, yeah, it's just part of life. I just take Metamucil every day, or I take these fiber tablets, or I have to take this, you know, laxative, or I got, you know, they're just like, it's whatever, you know, and I'm like, ah, it's, it's not quite right. <laughs> so then at a couple other po- time points in my life, I've, I've kind of gone, had regressions around that. And it's always connected to like high stress times. So after like our, our daughters were born, and we were, I was kind of in that sleep deprivation state for a long period of time. And trying to really push and grow my business uh, and still train super hard. And I found myself kind of back in this like, oh my God, my digestion is like all out of whack again. Um, So sensitive digestive system to stress and then learning over the years, some foods work well and some foods don't work well. So I really got connected to this message about like, well, hey, you know, these plant foods you know, might not be like, they have a lot of defense chemicals in them. And they, there's a lot of things about them that are trying to not get eaten and digested and used for fuel. And those things might be impacting your digestion. So from that perspective, it allowed me to sort of really answer some questions about in a way, do like an elimination diet and and start to look at what foods, how foods made my digestion feel. And for years, especially when I was younger, it was always like, oh, all this protein that you're eating, you're, you know, that's why you've got like, that's why you're gassy. And that's why you got this, these issues. And, you know, I think protein gets a bad rap in the bodybuilding community is like the thing that makes everyone so bloated and gassy. And it's like, nah, I think it's all the, you know, fiber bars that you're eating and the, you know, these potential like 
low carb, uh, keto kind of things that you're like pumping in artificial stuff and likely like these big boluses of, you know, carbs, maybe not coming from, you know, maybe along with like a lot of plant-based sources, all that could be impacting digestion. So my digestion improved to a certain degree. And I was able to identify foods that really worked well for me. I also was really happy to be looking at my protein and fat consumption from a wider variety of sources. So getting into Oregon meats, looking at animal fats, uh, you know, to supplement my diet with, as opposed to just my standard avocado oil, olive oils, coconut oils that I had done, you know, in the past. Um, and that was, you know, eye opening and sort of just a way to get more variation into my diet that I appreciated. But some of the other confounding variables were that I started to, while I kept a similar macronutrient profile for the most part, as things went on, I started to experiment with really low carbohydrate fueling and actually doing things that would border on keto, like a hundred, less than a hundred grams of carbs a day. And, you know, you make up for that. I wasn't like eating excessive amounts of protein, but I make up for that with like higher fat. Um, so really for the first time, I think in my life, I was eating a low, low carb diet and a high, high fat diet, but all those fats for the most part were coming from animal sources as opposed to plant sources or a mixture of, right? I always had a mixture in the past. When I really look at the macronutrient and the nutrient profile of my fatty acid intake, I was getting more saturated fat in this period of time than I'd ever had in the past. And now my anecdotal experience is I didn't feel like I processed nutrients as quickly or that I was like, my nutrients were fueling my, like giving me the energy that I wanted or convertible energy that I wanted to train. Now people are like, what the hell does that mean? It's like, I'm not really sure how to like what that is on a cellular science level, but something felt a little off for me. Um, and I, over time was like, I think I need to be eating considerably more carbs. Like the animal base, you know, kind of general prescription was like this. And I'm like, that's not actually working that well for me. I don't, I don't think, I think I need more carbs. And if I'm just going to eat this from honey and fruit, there's a lot of volume that I'm, I need to get. I can mm. cut that. And, and as the volume of food went up, my digestion started to get pissed again. Mm. It didn't matter that they were good sources. It was just like when you eat five mangoes a day and three bananas and four apples and, you know, you're just piling this stuff on plus a bunch of zucchini. I was like, ah, just, I'm just chewing a bunch of plant material a lot and it's not feeling awesome. So that became an obstacle for me. I did some diagnostic or some blood work blood chemistries and, and consulted with a, a doctor. And I've always like, because I've always eaten a relatively mixed diet and, um, you know, I, I've never shied away from fats and I've never really counted how, where my fats are coming from. Um, I've often had like a, a slightly elevated LDL, but my HDL and triglycerides have always been super healthy. And I have no other markers of like metabolic health or dysfunction. My LDL like doubled or almost more than doubled. Hmm. Again, there's a lot of like conflicting information and argument amongst some clinicians and some doctors and Paul Saladino, for example, where it's like, hey, uh, elevated LDL is actually not, it's not bad. You know, there might be some reason why that's good. And in particular, if all these other markers are really healthy. But as somebody who's just been around the health and wellness scene for a long time, it's hard for me to see my LDL go from 120, which is borderline a little high, to 300. I was like, oh, that's really fucking high. You know, the mo every, most clinicians would just be like, whoa, that's, let's put you on Lipitor, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that alone, if I was feeling like this is the greatest I felt in my life, you know, I went from feeling like I was almost optimized to being like a superhero. I'd be like, whatever, like, this is great. Like, I, I'm not going to let that stop me from feeling my best, but I was not feeling, you know, I wasn't feeling, I wasn't feeling bad, but I wasn't feeling radically different than I was 
six months prior to that. There were a couple elements of it that I was like, oh, this feels like something I want to take away, but I want to start to transition back to something different and see if I can just through, you know, diet and whatever, make some manipulations, see if my blood chemistries will adjust. And lo and behold, six months later, they did. I, and and I, really all I implemented was I'm going to try and get the RDA around the RDA plus a little bit of fiber every day. And I'm going to make sure I don't go over 50 grams of saturated fat per day, which is still a pretty high amount for most people. It's above the RDA and I'm still eating, you know, hundred to 150 grams of fat a day. So I'm not like going low fat suddenly. And that plus like introducing, you know, I'd more, I'm getting more carbs now and just kind of went back to like more of a balanced macronutrient split. Things normalized and I felt, I've, I've felt quite good. Uh, and, and more recently I've taken some of those macronutrients a little bit to the extreme and I've, I've bumped my carbohydrates up even more and kept my fat at like a, a very good maintenance level. And that's had, you know, a positive impact on me too. So super long winded. I'm going to pause again, let you jump in with a follow-up question, redirect this. If- so long story short, LDLs were massively up and, um, overall you felt you needed to kind of rebalance the carb ratio and bring in some vegetables. Is that kind of, if, if you're kind of distilling down what you shifted back towards that, that's the crux of it. I would say so. I mean, and I didn't think like, oh, I need to bring vegetables back in. Mm. I was like, what foods do I really like? You know, yeah, let yeah, me just, gotcha. I'm not going to like, I love a salad. Like a salad tastes great to me. And if I eat a big salad and then I'm like, you know, having loose stools in the morning with like lettuce in my, in the toilet, like that doesn't, I, I don't like that, you know? So I've been navigating like, well, what, what things, but I love a roasted Brussels sprout. I love a, you know, a salad. I love, you know, having just, snacking on carrots and, you know, salt on a cucumber. And like, that's just, it's tasty to me. And I'm not going to, I'm like, I, it's not just because I think it's healthy for me. It's like, I actually enjoy it. Like, you know, so I didn't want to remove things that I enjoyed. Um, mm-hmm. but I wanted to balance out my macronutrient profile and I wanted to see if I could, you know, I was eating exclusively basically ruminant animal meat. I wasn't eating any chicken, or any fish or really anything outside of just like mostly beef, but some, some wild game. And, you know, I wasn't eating like the fattiest cuts of those, you know, animals, but I wasn't shying away from eating, you know, 80, 20 beef every single day and ribeyes and things like that. And so I just started to be a little bit more intentional about like, okay, I'm going to mix up my protein sources, my animal sources, and think about getting some that are lower fat just get me good animal protein and try to hit those numbers that I mentioned around, you know, saturated fat intake and fiber intake. So when you think about your relationship to food, I think if I've got my timeline right, probably over the last 15 years, and you mentioned early on very briefly about kind of body image stuff as well, which I guess generally speaking is probably more aligned with women talking about body image, but it was good to kind of hear you speak of that briefly. How would you describe your relationship with food over the last 15 years in terms of obviously the education, the preparation, your own, I guess, image around food, but how, how has that evolved for you over the last kind of 10 to 15 years? My experimental nature of things is, is always, I'm going to trial something and and really push it the the extreme in an effort to optimize or be the best or, or just learn as much as I can. So, and I'll push it until something breaks basically, which I did with, dieting in college to get really, really lean. Like I, I went to the extreme most calorie deficit, training hard, super low body fat percentage, kept dieting, kept doing the same thing. Never really took a break, got an injury burned out. Okay. Well then I learned something from that. Then kind of the next evolution was, all right. It was like, I went through that all or nothing mentality, like phase where I was super lean. And then I rebounded and I was over for me. I felt over fat. I felt overweight for, you know, two years. I was struggling with that for two years. I was like, well, how do I overcome this? Well, I got to redirect my focus. I got connected with some people that got me thinking about food for health. I was like, well, eating non fat everything and eating, you know, super high protein and a bunch of processed carbs, like it might get you super shredded. 
but it might not be the healthiest, most wholesome diet. And what's a what's that look like? So taking people to, you know, help me understand what health looks like through food from a perspective that like was taught by Paul Check and some like really forward thinking individuals 20 years ago. So that was the next phase of kind of learning through food. But once you learn what health food is, even if it's truly like these are healthy foods and this is a healthy approach, but you have no quantity metric to it, you can still overeat and you can still arrive at a body that you're dissatisfied with. So I found that was like, okay, I, I'm eating good foods. I'm nourishing myself super well. My performance is in, improving. I'm getting super strong again. I'm overcoming my injuries. I can do everything I want to do, but I'm, I'm heavier than I want to be. I'm soft. I don't like that. I don't want to be that way. Okay. Then I go back into a, what do I, what can I take from that? And then apply some of my principles and, and, and experience of quantity control to try and achieve a level of leanness that I once liked. And so now I'm doing that on top of maybe better food choices than I did back in college. But if you push that too far, even with healthy foods, you know, you can't diet forever and you can't be super lean forever. So then, all right, what happens next? This is where I hit kind of a low point in my mid twenties of like, wow, I'm still kind of stuck in this body image, you know, rut where I just only want to see myself a certain way. And it forces me down this path of kind of restrict, restrict, restrict. This is when I found CrossFit. And when CrossFit came into my life, the focus became more on, well, eat quality foods and perform, get better, get better. That You can't do that on locale. You got to eat food and you got to recover. You got to eat carbs. You got to, you know, I had to relearn what it meant to eat to perform. And CrossFit was beautiful because it was like the first time where I, I could kind of just focus on eating enough, eating good foods, but I was training so damn much, like my training intensity and volume was so high that my, I kind of kept a physique that was like pretty, you know, I was really happy with without having to really count anything. So I just was like, oh, for X number of years, I'm just going to let go of counting quantity. But, you know, I was, I was accounting for qu quantity through my energy output, right? I was just like, you know, it's like those super lean athletes that just eat like crap food. And you're just like, how do you stay so jacked? It's like, well, they're just burning a lot of calories. Like, and so I was kind of, I was eating quality foods, a lot of it, not counting how many calories I was eating, but I was just out training it almost like on a consistent basis where every fourth or fifth day I needed like a cheat meal just to keep, you know, enough calories in. Right. And that, that was, that was a very unique place to be a place that most people are never in. They're not in that. Like I need a refeed day every fifth day. It's like refeed days are not for the gen pop. Like you don't need refeed days. You know, it's for people who are really pushing performance hard and training a lot or dieting too aggressively. So I don't know if that answers your question, but those have been some of the, that's been some of the journey and how I've, I've like related to food at different times and learn things. And then it set me down a path of exploration. And then I educate myself, give myself experience and then, okay, I upgrade what I know so that I can teach people and, and have a more balanced experience going forward. You see kind of reading between the lines with your work and your posts and I guess how you position yourself, someone who thinks beyond the four walls of the gym a lot as well in terms of nutrition and training. From a, I guess, a mindset point of view, you've mentioned it now a couple of times, your body image. And as someone who is regarded as, as probably one of the best physiques in the world, how, how do you um, deal with that mentally? In terms of, you know, if you looked at your, the, the way that you treated your body in your 20s and, and now much later in your life, is, is there a good sense of pressure? Do you feel overwhelmed at times? Are you really, you know, tough on yourself from a critique point of view? What, how would you describe your relationship with your own physique and sense of self and body? Well, I think it's just, yeah, I mean, I, if I've mentioned body image a number of times, I just want to like normalize that as like a, a, a a topic for people because everybody has a body, their body self-image, like mm. what they see when they look in the mirror and what you see when you look in the mirror is not what everyone else sees. Mm. Like people are going to look at you and see 
their own version of you that they project their own feelings, experience, life, desires, whatever onto you. So it's the thing that you see in the mirror and how that image that you see impacts your actions, your thoughts, your feelings, uh, your ability to achieve goals or not achieve goals. Like that's what we're talking about. And some people have um, <clears throat> their image of themselves just gen generally positively impacts all those things. Some people, you know, the image that they see in the mirror generally is at odds with all of the things that they want out of a positive relationship in their life. It makes relationships hard for them. It makes dieting hard for them. It makes going to the gym hard. It makes uh, feeling uh, empowered by successes hard. They lose weight and they look in the mirror and they don't feel good about it. They feel they feel undeserving. They, you know, there's all kinds of, there's a whole spectrum of what people see and how it impacts their, their actual life experience. I talk about body image because I've had enough experiences over the past 15, 20 years where what I see in the mirror has a negative outcome in my life, or mm -hmm. it, it has an outcome that later on I look back and be like, oh, that wasn't so awesome. That wasn't healthy. I didn't, it didn't feel good. And I could say that there are the periods of time where it's a very healthy relationship and a positive relationship is, you know, those are the times in my life that I want to replicate more of, right? Uh, I think we should all, we should all be so fortunate to look in the mirror, see somebody that we love and that is in, it encourages us to go out and do great things in life and not be inhibited. And unfortunately, if I, I would guess that the majority of people don't see that person every single day. So what has, what is, where is it today versus where has it been in the past? You know, I'm not somebody who likes to, uh, I don't look in the mirror very much. Um, it's not something I, I would say that, you know, I'm fairly critical. That's one of the, I think, drawbacks of having periods of time in my life where I got exceptionally lean or I saw myself in a particular way that was like, damn, that's, you know, that looks great and that's optimal, but it's not something that's achievable or maintainable or sustainable for life. So if you kind of achieve an ideal, and this is a lot of men and a lot of men that have done bodybuilding feel this way, where it's like they've seen themselves at the best, the peak of the peak. And then most of the year, most of the years of their life aren't going to be spent at the peak of the peak. That's a small window. And so during that time, they're critical, like, oh, I don't look as good as I did at that day. And so I'm less of a person or I'm less of a this or however that gets extrapolated into their psyche, into their emotions, into their, you know, their, their thought process. Um, so I experienced some of that, which has made me, of course, want to diversify, like, where do I, you know, how do I measure self-worth? Like, well, I measure self-worth through how I am as a parent, how I am as a husband, how I am as a coach how I move, what I'm capable of doing physically. Okay. My body isn't like as lean and as aesthetic as it's ever been, but guess what? I'm, I'm getting stronger right now. And I've, I've been lifting heavier weights than I've lifted in a long time. And so I, I try and diversify that in a lot of ways. I also focus a lot on how food and my relationship to food makes me feel like when I can eat food that I am like, wow, this, I feel so energized. I feel so good. I digested it. Well, like, I know this is good for my body. That helps me with my self-image. I mm. could look the same in the mirror after five days of eating foods that I know made me feel good and work with my body. But then the following you know, Monday, I look in the mirror and I, I might look exactly the same, but I ate a bunch of, I, I drank alcohol that weekend. We ate out at restaurants. I you know, had foods that like, you know, didn't, they tasted amazing, but they didn't make me feel the best. And I might see it a different person be like, ah, I'm just aware of these connections. And uh, the good or the bad of it is really comes from like how much time is spent thinking about that and how much time is spent thinking in a negative way. And when that gets too much, like I'm thinking about it too often or it's too negative, that's a time for self-reflection. Be like, okay, something's got to give, something's got to change. Like this isn't working right now. And I'd rather be spending all that mental energy and time on my kids, on my wife, on my business, on other things that are really important. But here I am doing this. And that's, you know, that's, I think that's what most people are, are striving for. So I feel like, okay, uh, I'm living this experience. I'm going through it myself. And that puts me in a position to be a, you know, a thoughtful, 
educator, somebody who's empathic with people who are dealing with this on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, is it, it, I wouldn't say it's at like a, a it's not at a bad place right now, but uh, it's something that's, it's going to be probably an ongoing thing in my life. And the big complicating factor is that, you know, I'm shirtless on social media, like most days of the week. And it's been connected to me and my brand for a long time. And I don't believe that like somebody is going to unfollow me if I, you know, my body fat percentage goes up by five points, you know, um, <laughs> but it might have an impact. It might impact how much reach we get or how, you know, what the impressions we get on social media, or it might just be something psychological that I'm, I'm not sure like how it's going to impact the, the business. And therefore I don't allow myself too much leeway to like, you know, explore what it's like to put on extra body fat and, you know, change my diet dramatically in a way that might go through a bulk or something like that, that uh, maybe somebody else would, who doesn't have a lot of visibility, you know, like they never take their shirt off except for like once a year at the pool and the rest of the year they can kind of, you know, I mean, you can look jacked and super fit and, you know, at five different body fat percentages, nobody, nobody ever knows. Cause you just, you're wearing a, you're wearing a hoodie. Like <laughs> It doesn't matter on that. And, and in amongst that chat, you mentioned the family and the kids and um, the business. It's a lot to balance. What does, what does a week for you look like? And obviously, as you, you mentioned your social media, um, you know, you, you're showing up there every day and no doubt, you know, you kind of potentially batch, um, videos and things like that. But what does what does a week in your life look like now with you know kids and family and running a very successful online business and your training and nutrition? What what are the kind of ins and outs of your kind of Monday to Sunday? Monday through Friday is uh you know it's it's the days to get work done. The kids are in school, you know it's preschool and kindergarten, so they're young, but they're you know we we're paying to have them or they're in public school, they're in a, you know, they're, they're being cared for for a certain number of hours every week. So those hours take advantage of them. And my wife and I both work, but every day has some aspect of parenting in it. You know, it's getting kids up and ready and out the door to school, dropping them off evening time, making them dinner, playing with them, bath, reading books, you know, like putting them to bed, cleaning up the house because they've, you know, terrorized the place and it's a mess. It's constantly a state of, you know, cleaning up a mess. So we try and make, make room to, to kind of connect with them. And I pick them up from school three of the days of the week. I drop them off two of the days of the week. My wife kind of takes the other shifts, um, but we're pretty on with them. And then the weekends are about creating some experiences for them and doing fun things that they'll remember and will remember as a family. Uh, we, my wife and I make time to train on the weekends together with friends. And so we will carve that time out and most of the rest of the time is with them. I will try and, you know, find early morning hours on the weekend or maybe a two or three hour block on a Sunday to sort of sit down and do some focused work or at least planning for the week. So that when I come into Monday and I get rolling Monday through Friday, I can be as a productive and as effective and as efficient as I can with the business. But that's kind of the the layout of it. You know, I train five days a week and four of those days are during Monday through Friday where I'm here at the gym training or at my house, but mostly here at the gym lately with, you know, some form of media uh, videographer who's, you know, our video producer who's on site and uh, full time you know, filming. And then we film content, different types of content almost every day. It could be podcasts. It could be demo videos. It could be short form Instagram content. It could be YouTube uh, episodes and content. Um, or it could be specific content that we produce just for our members in our programs where they get form review breakdowns. They get, you know, instructional videos. They get things that other people aren't, you know, able to see, but we have to make all that content as well. So a lot of talking to camera. And then in between, I, you know, I have, I have different teams that I check in with the leaders on. So our marketing department, our operations department, our, my business advisors, coaches, uh, those meetings have to happen. And there's many throughout the week. 
And I'll take those typically on Zoom, walking on the treadmill and just talking to people and catching up and strategizing and making plans. Other time is spent writing articles. So, you know, newsletter, blog content that I write. I've been doing that for years and I continue to do it every single week. I was doing that prior to this call. And then eventually there's, you know, sitting down to write programs, writing the programs that people do, um, which is, you know, that's the product. That's the, that's the thing that we're selling. So I pour a lot of hours into that. And then, but I also have a team that helps me test and refine that program over and over and over again before we release it. We're always six to eight weeks ahead with our program creation and development so that by the time it lands in the training app for our followers, they're getting a very polished and revised and and clean version of it, just like you would go through, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, the, the editing and publication process of a book. It's like rough draft one, rough draft two, rough draft 20. Okay, we're ready to push out the final edits here and it's live. And even then, you know, mistakes happen, but we're getting better all the time. So that's the week. And it really starts at 5 a.m. every day. I wait, it's when I wake up and I don't really try to change that anymore. Because if I try and sleep in, it's usually, I mean, if it's ineffective, like I can't sleep in that long. Um, and getting up any earlier than that never yields good results for me. So it's kind of my window. I get about two hours of time before the kids are awake. And in that time, uh, I just kind of methodically set up my day with a few, you know, practices of self-care and you know, basically just time on my phone and on my computer, just quiet time. Um, and then the days always end about 30 to 60 minutes after the kids fall asleep. So they go to bed at 745. And so my wife and I are in bed by 830 or 845 so that we can rinse and repeat the process. And that's the same on the weekends. I don't go out late. I don't stay up late. In the off chance that we do uh, for a social event or something, I almost always pay the price the next day because I'm up still at 5 a.m. But sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's not. It's like, ah, it wasn't really worth staying up till you know midnight. Uh, um, although midnight's super late. We've done that once in the last like four years. But yeah, like you know, even 10, 10, 30, 11 p.m. getting home from a party or a dinner or something like that with some friends, um, you know, we're very selective with like how we spend that time because, you know, it, it, it impacts all the other hours of the days that follow. And oftentimes it's worth it. And, and sometimes I can kind of make a good wager that it won't be worth it. That's pretty much Monday to Sunday. And, you know, outside of an occasional trip here or there, uh, either for work or for a family vacation, it doesn't change really. Mate, I could, there's so much I could talk to you about. I know you um, got to shoot off as well, but appreciate you taking the time to jump on and, and good to kind of chat with you and get insight into the man behind uh, the profile. For those that want to explore you, the work that you do, where's the best spot for them to find you? Well, of course, people can find me at Marcus Philly on all the social platforms. Uh, we're, we're on pretty much all of them. But uh, I think a more intimate way to connect with the brand and me and my thoughts and what we're doing with our, you know, company is through those newsletters that I mentioned and the, the, you know, the, uh, which is just a, you know, it's an email list. So you sign up for an email list and we're not spamming you. We're, we're sending out, you know, legit content every week that um, it just doesn't, it's the stuff that doesn't get the views and the likes and the clicks on social media. Cause those algorithms have changed so much. So it's, but if it's a place that you're interested in learning more about what we're doing and from me, then it's a great place to do it. So you just head over to functional-bodybuilding.com forward slash free, F-R-E-E, and you get on the email list. Plus you get our, um, you know, last year we put together a kind of an FBB guidebook with some nutrition content and training content. So that's sort of the the free part of it. You get, you get a ebook, um, but really you're signing up to get the weekly, weekly content. So that would be where I'd, I'd direct people. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Marcus. My pleasure. Thank you, Blake. And, and thanks for just rolling with the conversation where, where, where it went. And uh, I know that these, this, is, this is something that I, I haven't talked a ton about on a lot of different shows. So this is definitely unique content that uh, you know, isn't just a regurgitation of my story that 
I've told a thousand times. So thanks for, for bringing it up and, and pulling it out of me. Awesome. Appreciate you, brother. You bet. <laughs>